It very much seems that things are ready to explode in Iceland. And the stage is set for Prince Dur and Oleg to go head to head. But this episode itself seemed more geared towards giving us a glimpse into the minds of these characters. We got to see more of these one-on-one -on -one scenes where they connected and communicated more openly than we've seen before. Especially with lots of those characters that were very hesitant to trust one another when the lines between the different groups were less defined and understood. So let's get into this episode. So in the Roos storyline, we pick up right where we left off, with Ivor and his crew making it out of the main palace, but not out of Kiev just yet. They return us back to the exact moment that Oleg begins to realize that something's bit off and he can't see where Igor is. I like how they play things in slow motion and trap us in this moment for as long as possible. The whole sequence is very nerve wracking and Vikings clearly intentionally wants to squeeze everything they can out of it. We have to sit in the car with Ivor slowly rolling by knowing that at any moment they could be spotted out and face the full unmitigated wrath of Oleg. I especially quite like that moment where the head priest of this posse kind of spots their cart and heads right for them. We have Oleg right there in the middle of the square getting whipped violently and the music switches to this big bass drop as they realize how bad of a situation they've just walked into. But to their immense fortune, this guy is either one the biggest GC in the world or quite possibly someone who is working for Prince Dur. And then we get that final shot of them rolling through the gates to their freedom, leaving Oleg behind, drenched in blood, groaning in pain as he gets lash after lash. So Igor makes it safely all the way to Northgot, and his return is even welcomed with a massive celebration. Rather strangely, when Prince Dur sees Igor, he barks, referencing that time that Igor did that to him during his rather humiliating capture in Kiev. Which is a little bit weird, but at least he has a good sense of humor about it, I guess. We actually see in both the return scene for Igor and when Oleg addresses the council that both these brothers have to play up their relationship with Igor as he is still the key to power and ruling in this region. I thought it was really clever how Oleg ended up twisting the situation to make it seem like Igor was still his beloved nephew and even using his reputation as being this mystical prophet to try and make people think that Igor is against Prince Dur and that they're actually fighting on his side. Though that probably won't be enough to get a lot of the lords fully on his side. Vikings even shows us this one lord who's making arrangements at the beginning of the scene. That could easily be him planning against Oleg. Not to mention we see him not really buying what Oleg's putting down throughout the scene. We also get these three kind of intimate moments with the characters in the Roost storyline over the episode. The first one rather brief between Ivor and Katya when he tells her that he loves her. And in response we get this very perplexing look from her. She almost wants to say something but can't think of it and looks down instead. She also seems really out of place in the celebrations and the cheer, which really contrasts to the fact that they've just made it to their freedom and that they should be happy. But it seems that Ivers dropped most of the weariness he's had around her and is fully committing. The next isn't really a moment between two people, but rather Oleg with a stone statue of his dead wife. Which for him, isn't that strange. For one, we at least understand now that Katya isn't at least a plant for Oleg as he speaks of her betrayal by himself. It is pretty funny when he realizes he's being cucked by a cripple, especially for someone with his kind of ego and sense of self-grandeur. How's he supposed to be this world conqueror who can defeat Constantinople if he can't even keep a wife? Then lastly, we get this kind of heart-to-heart -heart between Igor and Ivor. We've seen Ivor get closer and closer to Igor as he knows how important he is and he's kind of become the father figure and role model for Igor. And when he opens up to Ivor about how he felt like a cripple himself, like damaged goods, we really get a feel how much Oleg has affected Igor. Like he's a pretty messed up individual and he was throwing that all down on this young child who had no other people around him to support him, except for Ivor. And so it makes that ending shot with them together so much more heartwarming. But it also does leave us with a foreboding feeling because this is Vikings and Vikings loves to kill their children. It becomes very obvious to both Ginhild and Ingrid that they can't really resist Harold's hostile takeover and if they want a place in Kattegat then they're going to have to side with him. Both of them have a lot of history with Harold and understand what kind of character he is. And it's for that very reason that they don't want to be with him. Now it's quite interesting to see how Harold approached both of these characters differently. For Ginhild, he really went with a more humble and soft approach, trying to return back to the idea that her, Bjorn and Harold's fates are intertwined, and so it makes natural sense that he would step up after Bjorn's death. But for her, he can never be the replacement for Bjorn, he can only ever be a lesser version. 
In the scene between them, they also show this imagery of her putting this knife to her throat and kind of signifying that she's almost willing to give up her life rather than be forced to accept this new world and herald. In contrast with that, Ingrid's approach is a lot more practical, as her possible paths and choices in this new world are even more narrow than that of Ginhild's, and Herald's approach to her reflects that lower status she holds. Whenever he's in scenes with her, it seems to bring out his worst self, the kind of forceful take-what-you-want Herald that's so self-destructive, and when he finds out that she might be with his child, that steps up even further. It does seem that Harold's interference has brought a common cause between both Ingrid and Ginhild though. Even before Bjorn's death, we saw them bonding in certain ways and they didn't really hate each other as people, they just both had conflicting goals all the time. They competed over Bjorn's love, they competed for the election, but now that's gone so they can finally have a heart to heart with each other without those interfering factors. And then we got what could have been the most unsurprising betrayal of all time. Since the very first moment we saw this guy, he just kept giving weird glares to all the characters, popping up in strange places and looking very suspicious. We don't know what his relationship really was with Harold, we don't know what his relationship was with Ginhild or anyone else, but I guess none of that really matters now because, you know, he's dead. I did really enjoy the first scene we got between Harold and Eric, where they're both kind of sitting down and trying to suss each other out. Eric kind of politely floats some things, defends himself quite timidly, while Harold kind of has his own very shouty approach to that. In those earlier episodes, we didn't see Eric really fully commit to either Ginhild or Ingrid, and it seemed they were trying to keep his true motivations and beliefs hidden from us. But Harold seems pretty confident he knows the true person Eric is, and that's the kind of person he needs. And it wasn't too bad of a guess because he was at least somewhat right. So Harold finally gets coronated and becomes the official king of Kattegat. And with Bjorn dead, Ivor, Vixer and Uber out of the picture, he can finally truly say he's the king of all Norway. So our far-flung adventurers manage to survive the storm, minus one child, and make it to some new land. But even before they took their first step in their new home, they realize the daunting truth that this is no fertile land. Even after the long journey and the perils they faced, all they find is more of the same rough and cold terrain they left behind in Iceland. All these people came on this dangerous and difficult journey on the promise of a golden land. They wanted land that would grow tall trees with lush valleys, a place that they could prosper free and happy away from the war and blood that filled the lives in Scandinavia. So right from the onset, tensions are pretty high as most of the families feel they've been tricked or swindled. Not too dissimilar from what happened with Floki in Iceland, and we know how that turned out. So faced between the option of heading out to sea again and facing those challenges, to try and find the real promised land, or staying and developing the real land under their feet right now, well, the choice was pretty obvious. When Floki set up Iceland, he had a dream of the place being one big community. Everyone would share and work together in harmony and peace. He believed that Iceland was the land of the gods and that they should leave behind their very human failings. No fighting, no kings, no ambition. But they went the total opposite direction here in Greenland. Every family took a plot of land and clearly marked it as theirs. A very individualistic approach. They even show us with the aerial shot all the different houses scattered very far away from each other with their own little boxes around them. And we don't have to wait very long for a flaw in the system to pop up. They may have all started with their equal plots of land, but the moment a single inequality pops up, it starts to create a rift between the people, especially when they're all so desperate and just trying to survive. So Flatnose makes sure that everyone is very aware that it landed on his property, he owns the whale, and he has no intention of sharing for free. What seemed like a god sent to this community who was struggling to feed themselves, to have fuel for their fires, might actually end up being the very thing that tears it apart. And knowing Flatnose, he's the kind of guy that will defend his property with a swing of the axe. Despite the very dangerous circumstances evolving, we still got some really nice moments in the Iceland storyline. We followed Torvi trying to come to grips with the loss of her daughter, and Uber refusing to back down, still wanting to look for the Golden Land. Most of the people don't trust or like Athelstan because of this first stumble, but Uber seems to still place his trust in him. And at this point, he kind of has to trust him. He doesn't want to return back to Iceland or Kattegat a failure. And we also get this really interesting scene between him and the seer, where basically he was told to get off his ass and get out of here. But that's going to be a lot easier said than done, especially with the very explosive situation building up between him and Flatnose. So the episode had some good moments in it, and I quite like the conversations between the characters, but we haven't gone too far just yet. 
It feels like this episode has brought us to the doorstep of some pretty big showdowns yet to come, and I can't wait to see how these characters face those challenges and overcome them. So up next, episode 15. Thanks for watching. I know a lot of you guys who are watching through this review series aren't subscribed to the channel, so if you want to get updated to make sure you don't miss any of those videos, please hit the button below. And if you already are, then I'll see you next time.